ports. Among our customers, we have uh, both shipping companies, maritime ports, uh, energy companies, uh, and oil and gas, uh, pharmaceutical companies, uh, of course, government, financial sectors. So we protect many of uh, Singapore's critical uh, uh, institutes uh, in Israel and uh, globally. So we we have an, a, a, I, I know I participated in the preview session uh, last week. Uh, there, we're going to have some amazing talks. I just wanted to touch very briefly on what is the state of maritime cybersecurity. So first of all, and my colleagues will dive into this later, all four major, ship, major shipping companies have already been hit by cyber attacks. Maersk, Costco, MSC, and CMA have all been hit until uh, September of last year, either by ransomware or other type of malware events. Another trend that we're seeing is also uh, attacks directly on ships. So in the last, last couple of years, and again, my colleagues will talk about that, we've had uh, cyber attacks that have directly compromised operating systems of, of ships. Uh, in When you receive my presentation, you'll have links to a few of these stories that you can view into details. And another trend that we're seeing is direct uh, state nation involvement uh, on maritime activities. One of these examples was in uh, May uh, last year, uh, Iran's uh, Shahid Rahi port uh, experienced a major disruption, um, reportedly uh, caused by another um, country uh, with its name beginning with uh, I, uh, in retaliation for Iran, again, reportedly attacking uh, that country's uh, water infrastructures. The retaliation was a clearly visible and uh, highly disruptive attack on their maritime activities. So one of the challenges and why we're seeing this is that file-based attacks is still a significant attack vector on organizations. There are a few reasons for this. First of all, it's very easy to create malware that will evade scanning and detection technologies to create mutations. Also in the maritime environment and operational environment, we typically use highly complex and proprietary uh, control files, so like SCADA control files. There's also a challenge that organizations in this environment still need to use USB devices to update your shipping computers and update uh, other type of equipment uh, on board that can contain both malware risk and firmware, firmware risk. And there's just an inability to pr directly protect many of these computing appliances. So think about a PLC that you have uh, or a SCADA component that you have installed on the on the ship, you cannot update the operating system. You cannot even install it with uh, any anti-malware technologies. Now, a brief case study about this. We, you all might be, uh, might be familiar with uh, uh, the uh, sport watch manufacturer Garmin. Uh, so Garmin was hit last year by a massive uh, wiper ransomware attack by Straden called Wasted Locker. Uh, the attack completely disrupted the uh, service of millions of their users. But what is little bit little less known is that uh, Garmin is also a major manufacturer of navigation systems. And the question then arises if their critical navigation systems on airplanes and on ships were also impacted. Now, what is common about this attack and almost all of the other uh, wiper ransomware attacks is that Wasted Locker was in the wild since May uh, uh, 2020. So this was a known threat that was able to attack the organization, and this is what happened. So initially, attackers compromised a website. When users browsed that website, they were tempted to download a malicious software update. Again, this update was not detected by the security measures they uh, had or by like their endpoint AVs. Compromising the initial endpoint led to uh, privilege escalation, allowed the attackers to discover uh, network weaknesses and to propagate the attack to almost all of uh, Garmin's endpoints and services, and finally activate the ransomware um, in a synchronized uh, fashion. Uh, today, uh, many uh, of these attacks are also adding a data exfiltration component to uh, put additional leverages on who the people that are attacked. So a couple of insights that we're seeing from these events. First of all, file-based attacks still uh, compromise of a significant attack vector on these incidents. And second of all, we see 
exploitation of uh, networks that are not sufficiently segmented and several of our peers will uh, touch that. So we will need to uh, prevent that file-based attack and we will need to contain incidents uh, in, in its specific segments. So the way that we do this with our technology is with content disarm and reconstruction. It is a technology that is designed to prevent file-based attacks. And we do this with two very powerful components. Components. One component is pre-filtering the malicious files using a host of detection technologies. And the most significant one is understanding that detection can and will, will fail, that you still need to treat files as suspicious and then take the means to disarm the file, that is to take a file that might be suspicious, run all kinds of transformations on it to make sure that the file is threat free. The way we do this is uh, this way, we receive a file, we run multiple detection technologies, so multiple signature based AVs, next gen AVs, uh, including Sentinel-1 that was uh, just went through one of the world's uh, largest tech IPOs last week, and then file reconstruction to make sure that even if no threat was detected, the file that you receive is safe. Now we can apply this type of technology on multiple different scenarios that exist in operational and maritime environments. One of the most common uses is with portable media, right? So you, you would bring in the portable media. We have a solution called a cybersecurity kiosk that does two things. It will scan the files uh, on the USB drive, and we can also prevent malicious firmware from uh, attacking the uh, organization, uh, which is extremely useful. Like I said, in maritime environments, there are documented incidents where a malicious USB has been brought into a ship and caused disruptions. Again, if you received a presentation, you received the notes. Like I said before, preventing the file-based attacks is extremely important. So you need to apply this in a smart way inside of the ship so you can install our uh, uh, USB scanning kiosk on the bridge or in the IT room, and we can provide it in extremely compact form factors because we understand that space is limited. Now, protecting one network segment is not enough, so you can also apply CDR together with my peers that are working with uh, data diodes to ensure that files flowing in from one network segment will pass the, C the content disarm and reconstruction technology to make sure that what goes into the operational environment is extremely safe. And to, if I take the analogy of a ship, right, we understand that an incident will always occur. There might be a breach in one area of that ship, but we don't want a initial hull breach to be a catastrophe. And the same way you can use CDR to make sure that an incident in one network segment will not be able to propagate into others and cause an enterprise-wide disruption. Now, we can apply CDR, of course, on other content routes. We can integrate it with uh, mail, like Office 365, integrate it with uh, browser isolation. So we have our peer here from Menlo Security and can deliver it in multiple other content delivery routes. Um, that was uh, my presentation, uh, again, we need to prevent the initial uh, attack vector. You need to contain incidents. And today in the era of COVID, we can also become quite uh, creative in how we deliver the solution. So, you know, of course, we would like to come on board, but if we would like to throw a bottle, we can do that as well. Thank you very much. And I'll be glad to answer questions later on. Great. Thank you so much, Oren. Now, Building on the momentum that Orange just gave us, a uh, second uh, set of speakers, uh, very close uh, place to my heart, actually, uh, because on a personal level, uh, threat intel is something I, uh, it's what I used to uh, to evangelize. It's something I uh, I find incredibly interesting, right? Because um, w when you look at the history of, of the hacking world, okay, um, and threats, um, they really front end geography and borders, and the fact that um, uh, even different nation states, all right, have got different ways of introducing um, the way they go about their attacks, all right. For instance, and this is stereotypical, right? Um, the, the Russians are known for being smooth. I know there's been a lot of press 
uh, with the Kelowna pipeline in the last 48 hours on this point. Uh, in general, they're known to leave uh, less signatures, fewer signatures uh, than, say, uh, the Chinese units or even the North Korean ones. Uh, so without further ado, and I'm very aware that there's a very wide international audience here, right? We've got friends from uh, Saudi Aramco, Dubai dialing in today uh, over in Japan, um, uh, also dialing in from MOL. Uh, we wanted to invite our next few speakers, uh, Kevin as well as Austin. Uh, Kevin from Flashpoint Threat Intel Company. Um, he's uh, not only speaks fluent Mandarin, um, I, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Pan Wentong. Uh, Good afternoon, sir. How are you? Now we'll uh, add the, bring the mic over to him. Um, uh, Kevin, because it's uh, we've got people from the Middle East, uh, Singapore, um, Singapore government as well uh, on this call, uh, we wanted to keep it as uh, international as flavor as possible. Uh, so we'll do this particular segment in English. Uh, but for those of you who uh, who would like um, a uh, proof of value, okay, or even just a sharing session, no obligation, uh, right after this, uh, Kevin uh, Dennis, uh, who is the country head for Flashpoint uh, over here, based in Singapore with his team, and Austin, who's also dialing in from the East Coast, New York City, uh, will be happy to do it. Um, more importantly, right, um, and I just want to take a pause here because um, this is something that I always found very useful. Um, when I used to, we used to speak with people about threat intel, one of the most common questions we used to get asked is, yes, it's great tech, but do you understand our region? All right. Do you have um, a Bahasa translation? Do you have analysts who understand our region? And I'm delighted to share that in particular, uh, Dennis's team, okay, uh, have been are fluent in uh, Japanese, uh, fluent in Mandarin Chinese. Um, and they've got assets, all right, in each of these markets. And what this means in practical terms, okay, is that if there is a threat, um, that is something that you um, and your team should know about, all right? Dennis and his team are, are here to help. And I want you guys to know that, okay? Uh, Pan Wen Tong, over to you. Thank you so much. Just going to share my screen now. Uh, yeah. is this okay? This screen too, sure. Are you guys able to see my screen? Not yet. Oh no. We can present it, please. Oh, just a bit of uh, technical difficulties there. I believe he got disconnected. I'm sure he'll be uh, online again. Um, Completely up to you, Austin, if you want to, uh, if you want to drive. Yeah, I think uh, what just happened there was uh, in order to give access to the screen, um, Microsoft Teams had to quit. Uh, so I, I believe that's where uh, Kevin just went. No um, worries. When Tong is back. Kevin? Yeah. Yes, I am. Awesome. Would you be able to share your screen? Having tough technical difficulties over here. Um, sure thing. Let me present. Let's see if this works. Um, are you all able to see this? See my yes. screen? Yes. There is a cool. snail. So, <laughs> oh, there is a snail. Uh, can you see my presentation? Yes. Yes. Perfect. All right. Um, All righty then. I'll get started. Yes. So, Daja Hall, and welcome everyone. My name is Kevin Balicki, and I'm an analyst at Flashpoint based in New York City. My colleague, Austin Teresic, and I are very excited to be speaking with you all today about the importance of cybersecurity in the maritime industry. Specifically, we will be discussing how Austin and my colleagues use Flashpoint collections to find threats to the maritime industry, specifically those targeting, or excuse me, those targeting and originating from Asia. Before we begin, just a short introduction about ourselves. 
As I mentioned earlier, my name is Kevin Balicki, and I'm an analyst here at Flashpoint focusing on counterterrorism and physical security. However, I also do a lot of work involving database breaches and Chinese language research as well. Hi, everyone. My name is Austin Tursuk. I'm an analyst at Flashpoint working with the Tactical Threat Monitoring Team. Uh, my specialties are generally focused more towards the technical side, working with information stealing malware, uh, the recent trends related to ransomware and extortion gangs, as well as digital defense and penetration testing techniques and methods. Uh, so today we'll talk about some of the basic tenets uh, that we can use to secure uh, our systems within the maritime industry and how threat intelligence plays a role in that. Before we do that, though, we wanted to play, uh, lay a little ground uh, work for what um, Flashpoint kind of grabs its information from. And uh, Flashpoint collects information from a huge number of sources throughout the deep and dark web and other, uh, other sources where threat actors may lie. Uh, you can see we have a huge store of stolen credentials that we're continually updating to ensure that our, uh, our clients and those that we work with are, uh, are not at risk. Uh, we also collect on a huge number of illicit marketplaces and forums where threat actors uh, speak and engage with one another, sharing their tactics, techniques, and procedures. Um, and while some organizations may be focused on specific regions, we do take a very holistic approach. You can see we have a, a number of languages, including Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese, Russian, Ukrainian, and uh, over 20 other languages. So. With that, let's talk about one of the largest threats we're seeing uh, right now. Uh, as with most industries, uh, maritime logistic, uh, maritime and logistical industries are seeing heavy impact from uh, the current activity related to ransomware and extortion gangs. So this is a, a dashboard that Flashpoint uh, maintains where we collect information on the various ransomware and extortion gangs. And you could see this is about the last 90 days uh, and in that 90 days, there had been around 400 reported breaches. And a notable uh, portion of this, I believe there were around 20 or 30, included um, the organizations listing in the maritime uh, and logistical. And even in the past presentation, we saw um, out of the four major shipping organizations, at least three of them have already been hit with ransomware. Uh, and from a maritime and logistical standpoint, these groups are incredibly dangerous uh, for an industry that's based on the constant movement of product uh, and the constant flow of uh, their vessels extortion gangs and ransomware gangs have a huge opportunity to potentially make massive payouts uh, simply because any downtime and any halting of the system is incredibly damaging to an organization's bottom line. So let's take a couple, uh, let's take a look at a couple examples that we've collected on. So this was an example from May of 2021, so only several months ago, where uh, a threat actor on one of the high tier forums we collect on was selling access to a, um, a maritime company with uh, the, the, organ the, the specific branch they breached was in Singapore, but they had branches in India, Malaysia, uh, and were, head were headquartered in Norway. You can see just based off of the, uh, s the basic information they provided, they had a lot of information such as employee information, total systems, uh, as well as the, uh, the revenue of the company. Now, this type of access is incredibly valuable uh, to some of these more advanced extortion ransomware gangs because they would purchase some access like this and <clears throat> use it to spread their uh, malware and cause further damage within an environment. Uh, sorry, can we just, uh, sorry, Austin, it's uh, Ewan yeah. uh, speaking. I just wanted to, uh, to take an opportunity to uh, interrupt. Could you just go back one slide? Uh, because mm -hmm. I know that among the uh, 70, 80 plus uh, members of the audience here, um, a lot of you are genuinely seeking um, examples of how this is relevant to your home market, okay? Uh, and for those of our invitees who are from the likes of PIL, uh, MPA, PSA, uh, just wanted to focus on this particular slide because it showcases um, how a Singaporean maritime company, right, um, headquartered in Norway, uh, has got a threat like this in their inbox that their IT teams their senior level leadership, their C-level suite has to actually handle and manage probably before it gets to the press, okay? 
Um, and this isn't just to show that it's got they've got capability and cap in this particular type of sector, but it's to show that this can happen to anyone. Uh, we were speaking with the uh, with Patrick Lim, uh, CEO for uh, BH Global, just just before this session, our rehearsal, and he brought up a very good point uh, just now, which is uh, shipping uh, something that transcends geography, right? 90% uh, of the ships in the world are headquartered in the Marshall Islands and Liberia, okay? So it doesn't matter that if it's something from Singapore, if it doesn't matter that if it's something living Jurong Port, which is not far away from us, uh, or even uh, in, in, in Tokyo in the Tsukiji market, it doesn't matter, okay? If, if a ship is seen to not have enough cybersecurity implemented, starting from 21st January of this year, the IMO has said that there's the chance that it can be prevented from living port, okay? And I know this is like GDPR, right? We've all heard the story. We're all waiting for the first MNC to sort of be highlighted, probably after an earnings call, probably after an end of quarter like yesterday. Uh, and for many of the larger companies out there, I know because you have told us at Athena, right, that you are concerned about how this is a real and present danger to your company. So what IMO needs and what they've said is that if a company can demonstrate that they've got sufficient effects taken to preventing a cybersecurity attack, then they will not take action against these ships leaving port. And I know that uh, many of you here are also waiting for uh, Bureau Veritas, who's going to talk a bit about compliance uh, with uh, Philippe in just a moment. But I just wanted to pause on this particular example because it really showcases how relevant uh, threat intel uh, actually is to your business. Not someone else's business, but your business today. Thank you, Austin. Back to you. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's very important to consider when looking at the entire uh, kind of lifespan of a breach, there's a lot of points where you can catch it and there's a lot of points where systems can fail. So in this case, clearly something in regards to the edge point security failed. However, you know, if this was your organization, this is something that you could very quickly see and identify yourself and um, either engage with someone like Flashpoint to engage with this actor and potentially purchase the access from them or even just lock up your own systems. So continuing, um, we have another example where uh, TRT International, uh, which provides development and application of repair solutions and engine turbine and aerofuel repairs, um, they had a database breach. And while a database breach may not sound as potentially damaging as access to an entire environment, there's a lot of valuable information that threat actors could take with this. Um, rather than targeting uh, TRT directly, they may now look to target potential clients uh, and uh, third party organizations, essentially making yourself a vulnerability to those that you work with. Um, and this was another sample we found where uh, access to a freight company worth uh, about $13 billion is being sold by a high tier Russian uh, speaking threat actor. Um, now, you, again, you can see here they've collected a lot of information such as where they're operating, uh, such as uh, the operation levels of the organization. Um, but what's really interesting is the asking price here, $8,000. Now, $8,000 may not seem like a very large amount. Um, or may seem like a large amount for uh, an individual to purchase, but it's important to remember the potential payout that these ransomware gang, uh, ransomware and extortion gangs make. Eight thousand dollars to them is nothing when you consider payments are upwards of multi millions of dollars. Uh, again, you know, looking at this type of situation, the entire lifespan of an attack. If if this was an organization that uh, seemed similar to yours, you had similar revenue or similar uh, access points, this is an important thing to keep in mind in regards to kind of cutting off that attack chain or as early as possible. Um, so now uh, we're going to pass it to Kevin, and he's going to talk about several uh, ways in which maritime organizations can look to protect themselves, uh, leveraging both uh, cyber intelligence and other just cybersecurity best practices. Thanks, Austin. After much thought, Austin and I created a list of four ways maritime companies can reduce the risk of ending up like one of the companies mentioned earlier. All of these were meant to be cost-effective, easy to understand, and high impact. 
So without further ado, The first and arguably most important tenant is using a password manager throughout your company. Password managers work by storing a user's login information for the website or internal tools and then help the user, the user log in automatically, saving time and money. It also prevents password reuse and protects your company from being affected by an unrelated database breach. This is best illustrated by the recent Colonial Pipeline hack. Russian hackers used an account found in a database breach to access the company's VPN, despite the fact that the account belonged to an employee who is no longer with Colonial Pipeline. The Colonial Pipeline hack cost the company $5 million, which was mostly retrieved, but also cost an incalculable amount of damage to the reputation. The cost of a leading password management tool by comparison is $8 a month per user. It also helps to have an intelligence vendor that tracks database breaches such as Flashpoint. At Flashpoint, we have a collection of breaches totaling 37 billion accounts and can notify your team if a password or email of yours ends up in a breach. The second tenant Austin and I came up with is the importance of maintaining regular patch cycles. With new patch, with new patches may cause problems in an organization's IT infrastructure. Patching systems in a timely manner reduces the likelihood of an incident. At Flashpoint, we recommend rather than making a department responsible for patching, signing individuals the responsibility of patching ensures accountability when patch deadlines are missed. Without ownership, patch management is a task executed by many but owned by no one. The third principle Austin and I would like to speak with you about today is the importance of maintaining offline backups. Austin and I both believe a story about Maersk, the famous Danish shipping company I'm sure you're all aware of, drives this point home. In 2017, Maersk fell victim to the NotPetya attack unleashed by Russia. NotPetya ripped through the victim's internal networks, and despite IT employees at Maersk literally running into meetings and unplugging computers to save devices, Maersk lost nearly all of their 150 domain controllers. Wired published an article in 2018, and I selected a quote from the article you can see on your screens. I'm going to read the quote because I believe it really drives home the severity of the risk Maersk faced. Maersk's 150 or so domain controllers were programmed to sync their data with one another so that in theory, any of them can function as a backup for all the others. That's a centralized backup strategy hadn't taken into account for one scenario where every domain controller is wiped simultaneously. If we can't recover our domain controllers, a Marisk IT staffer remembers thinking, we can't recover anything. Thankfully for Marisk, although it didn't seem like it at the time, they were very lucky. There had been a blackout in Ghana, which caused one computer with the company's domain controller to remain offline. Maersk needed that computer to be flown to London where IT specialists were building back Maersk one step at a time. However, no one at the Ghana office had a visa to enter the UK. So Maersk had to pay for a Ghanaian employee to fly to Nigeria, pass the computer to a Nigerian colleague, and then have them fly uh, to London with the computer. I hope this case study illustrates the importance of meaning offline backups too, if possible. Lastly, all companies should have regular war games and simulations and establish best practices by doing the following shown on the screen. Strong companies are built on a teamwork mentality and it's important for companies to establish practices so that even employees on the lowest rung of the proverbial ladder know what to do in case of an emergency. Similar to a fire drill, when everyone is able to act on their own confidently, you reduce the risk of having to pay for remedial costs associated with a breach to your system. Everyone, thank you all for taking the time to listen to Austin on my presentation. We hope you feel more confident now on how to, secure, how to secure your maritime businesses. Are there any questions either Austin and I can answer? Anyone? Just a quick commercial break over here. If you have questions, if there's something on your mind, if you even want to ask, can we do a POV tomorrow? 
The answer is yes. Type it in the chat box and we will take care of you. All right. Now, our very next speaker, before we get into it, I want to show you something, everyone. Do you know what this is? I'll give you a clue, it's not mine. <laughs> it's a data diode. And it actually belongs to our next uh, speaker, uh, Professor Yu. Uh, many of you would have seen him uh, speak. He's a leading authority, okay, on, wow, AI in our country uh, over here in Singapore. Uh, true patriot, man. A lot of this groundbreaking uh, technology. Um, uh, has been has 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 brought so much credit, I guess, uh, to our little island state here in Singapore. Um, specifically, right when uh, he showed me this, uh, one of his data diodes. All right, um, the fact that it, he's got a cloud version, a driverless version, um, and the thinking, the sheer thinking, and the two and a half years that went to developing something like this, putting it through CCAL certification. The journey has been amazing and at times I can imagine exhausting. Um, Professor Yui is going to do a very, very small segment of the uh, of the sharing that he often does uh, at, our, at our country, uh, even as he briefs uh, the ministers in our country, senior government leaders. Um, it's truly a pleasure to have him on board today. I got to say, uh, even for myself, uh, Yuan personally, this is one of the speakers that I was most hoping forward to uh, see today. And in fact, I really wish that I could give him 20 minutes instead of 10. Prof, we've already got uh, nine minutes, 10 this afternoon. Over to you, how data diodes can help you in maritime. Prof, over to you. Thank you so much. So uh, what I'd like to do is to uh, first with you an understanding if you don't know what data diode is. So if you have seen, uh, let me see. Okay, so if you see this uh, rectifier symbol, you will see that signal comes from one end and goes to the other end. And you could recognize that this is electronic data diode. So basically it's a unidirectional data flow system. Now, if you look at a post box, uh, this is exactly what it is. So a post box, you drop in the letters and then it will go out the other side. You cannot put in your hand and retrieve it from the other side, right? So let me just, uh, Give you a quick overview of uh, the company Amaris AI. So what we do is actually full stack AI. We have got uh, text processing, natural language processing. We have got edge computing. Uh, we have cybersecurity and we have AI cybersecurity and all the whole gamut of chatbots and uh, intelligent AI system using the most cutting edge systems. Now, very quickly, uh, James Kang is the uh, our CEO, and he was the uh, previous uh, government CIO. Patrick Chan is the uh, chief technology officer, Kega Master, and myself, I'm an old guy in the civil service uh, doing cybersecurity. So let me go into the meat. So this, this problem of what must we protect and how do we protect? So in ships and on land systems, you have two parts. One is the standard IT, and then you have the operational technology, those uh, systems and better systems like PLC, CAA, and so on. And today, now you add in IoT. So the way to protect it is actually to do what the military would do. We put in high war against attacks, and you could put it on the onshore organization here. And inside the ship, you have to put it uh, basically between the IT and then the onshore systems, and also between the business system and also the uh, control systems that you are now using. Now, the whole technology is not just uh, data diodes that's giving you networks, but we also have an area that is called zero trust, which is very relevant today. And, and we offer this and we put it together with software defined parameter. Okay. And you now allow IoT devices to get to the data diodes and the data diodes then bring the data inside. But at the same time, why don't we make it very friendly? And we call that transparent security. Mix it such that the data diodes are not seen. And then we put in place things like gateways, like WhatsApp gateway, Telegram gateway, email gateway, and so on. So you just use it as normal and automatically the data that goes through the gateway is then passed over. 
And when it goes over, we will then run data sanitization. And you heard from Sasa, this is the CDR story that we talked about. So focusing on what you should do as protection, what you want is protection that you don't have to maintain and you leave it like, like a, a Wi-Fi diode uh, a router, let it run on and on and on, okay, right? So one of the issues that was mentioned earlier was that you do need to update with patches. And so, for instance, if your Windows systems, and then you would like it to be such that you don't have to sort of like carry a USB drive and so on and do all this manually because the patches are today highly automated, for instance, Microsoft. So you would need to put a data diode with a special WSUS gateway. And so this thing will run as if you are connected to the internet. So this is one very powerful usage. You take the patches, uh, it will run automatically and then go through the data diode. And then on this side, it will then start patching up the system. So we have built systems for this. The other thing is to get the data over. So today you get all kinds of data. You have now IoT data. So you have got smart ropes uh, that is from the outside. In the past, this doesn't exist. Then you even have uh, maybe COVID controls. You have got CFRS ID scanners and then your biometrics and so on. So all this would be transactional data that you have to bring it onto the ship or onto the business systems. And you bring that in uh, and through the data diode. I want to bring you and give you a few interesting demonstrations. Okay, And what I want to show you is now the arrival of not only IoT, but what we call AI IoT, right? AI IoT actually puts intelligence at the edge. And this is transformational in the sense that you could now have as if you have a human, right, at the edge, now a man handling many systems. So let me just show you. Yeah, so we just take, this is like a Defects, right? So these are our digital humans that we have produced. We deliberately made it such that it is not too uh, realistic. And, and because now you also have uh, drones bringing in data, you would now have AI uh, handling a container ID recognition. And let me just show you this quick issue of having this embedded IoT type, AI IoT uh, on systems. Okay, so this is, you put a little box, okay? And then you drive it and then all oh, you just take a look and then you will catch all the cars that are now going through. So this would be really what would be coming very soon, right? Hello. Right. The next story is we talk about ransomware. Now, it is important because it's not just a matter of doing a sort of like offline, right? but because now we have sensitive transactions that are doing online and they are running through all the time. So what is needed is this. You take all this data, it comes through the diode, and the moment it comes through, we sanitize it, and we have a second diode that will very quickly put it onto a file backup. So in other words, you would always be able to restore back in case of bin attack by ransomware, and you get your transactional data also protected because the attacker couldn't get through these two layers of diodes. Now, what makes this diode special? Number one, it is the driverless data diode because it looks and like a USB device. So you don't have to install a sending program, right? So we got that EAL uh, certified uh, and it's very, very small as you have seen, okay, right? And, and so what, what, quickly just to sum up, right? Uh, low power, easy to install, very easy to integrate, okay? And, and it is fairly inexpensive and it's portable, you can put it in your pocket. Now, what has happened uh, in the last year is that the uh, GovTech has got project for visitor management system for all public buildings. So this is a series of uh, basically our customers, but all the customers like MAS, MOF, they have installed this data diode primarily for the purpose of protecting building management systems. So you don't want your escalator, your lifts, and and all these uh, power systems, air conditioning to be attacked, then the whole building will have to close down. So our data diodes are now there, uh, running nonstop, protecting the system for this kind of threat. And this is something that we have done work together with CSA and so on. Now, what else do we do? 
Besides this, it would be a great idea that we also incorporate the capability of uh, strong AI that not only now you have stopped the attacks, but why don't you also get intelligence? So we have been working with CSA, primarily this area of AI robustness, but we have developed uh, basically generation of malware systems that can evade AI detectors. And we have our own AI high-end uh, malware detectors that would then run through in front so that despite the fact it cannot get through, we want to know what's happening. So that's all I have. Thank you so much. And thank you, Prof. When we next meet, I'll give you your bio back. Thank you so much for this session. Moving on to uh, our next uh, our next speaker, all the way across the ocean over in Seoul. Um, I just wanted to uh, introduce uh, Mr. Ilya Fergin, uh, dialing in from the Samsung office, okay? And uh, Ilya is going to very much talk about uh, real-time anomaly uh, monitoring. Um, this, I know a lot of you are checking your Android Samsung phones right now, um, but don't don't go away. What he has to share is genuinely, genuinely exciting, all right? Also, take a mini, mini commercial break. Uh, uh, a couple of uh, speakers, um, actually, board his plane now in order to catch an international flight because of covid some of their flights have been brought uh, forward just a little bit so if you've got questions for any of the speakers uh, please uh, a lot of you have my uh, whatsapp number 61406510406 send me a text send me an email. we are all young people don't need to so call me directly and we will fill the questions for them for you yeah. take us away uh, good time of day, everyone. Uh, can you guys see the presentation and hear my voice? Perfect, yes. Perfect, yes. Perfect. Uh, so my name is Ilya Fagan, and I'm part of uh, Security Business Division at uh, Samsung SDS, based in Seoul, Korea. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar, SDS is an IT arm of the Samsung Group. Uh, so I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak with you today about uh, uh, IoT cybersecurity. So let's talk about uh, IoT. So IDC predicts that by 2025, we're going to have 41 billion of connected uh, devices. And these devices are very diverse from sensors, CCTVs, smart cars, uh, smart factory, smart meters, etc., etc. And of course, we have smart city, and smart ship. And smart ship is kind of like smart city because it has many diverse uh, IoT systems on one single ship. So it's like, like a small city by itself. And what we have with these ubiquitous devices is they're hyper-connected, highly autom automated and intelligent, which makes them highly autonomous, and they're also remote control. So all of this creates a new diversi diversified and large attack surface for sophisticated uh, hackers. Uh, and as a result, just in industrial control systems, there were 700 new vulnerabilities discovered in 2020 alone, which is a, a huge growth from, from 2018. So now, if you look at the maritime IoT trends uh, specifically, uh, we see that on the one hand, a maritime industry is adopting IoT very fast. And the reason, the, the main reason for it is uh, regulation compliance. For example, you might need the environmental sensors, but also for optimized maintenance, cargo handling, et cetera, et cetera. And as a result, because we are putting IoT on, on our vessels, many ships systems are becoming vulnerable, including the most critical ones like bridge systems, cargo handling, propulsion, etc. cetera. And, and the risks are very substantial. So of course, we can have operational interruption, uh, pollution, loss of cargo, uh, et cetera. And I'm going to talk more about some examples of, of that later. Um, and uh, uh, so we know that we have to use it as a risk. So it's very hard to do. We have legacy IT and IT systems that are uh, that have outdated uh, systems. We have uh, approval approval difficulties on installing new patches on those devices. Plus, the mixing works worse. Ships constantly communicate with shore parties and, and uh, have to uh, have the manufacturers of equipment on ships to be remotely controlled. So we have a very huge attack surface in the maritime industry. 
and uh, the hackers know this, and that's why um, in, in the last three years there was ninefold increase in the amount of cyber attacks in maritime alone. And, and the cybersecurity and the professionals in the maritime industry understand it well, and 77% of them uh, believe that the risk of uh, cyber attacks is medium to high. Um, and well, at the same time, only 42% of them believe that their vessels uh, are, are protected. So uh, as a result, uh, um, so Oren uh, mentioned uh, several, uh, several attacks that happened recently to the four major uh, global shipping companies. Um, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna repeat, and, and uh, Kevin mentioned Maersk as well. Uh, one additional one that we didn't talk about yet is uh, uh, Austal. It's an Australian supplier of warships uh, that uh, provides uh, the Coast Guards of US and others. They had uh, also additional attack, but the attacks are uh, everywhere and they keep growing and, uh, um, and you can see more and more of them. Oh yeah? So let's look oh yeah, sorry example. to interrupt. Yes. Uh, hi everyone, um, just could you uh, go back just one slide? Yep. Sure. Yeah. So we were reviewing uh, the footage from our, uh, our rehearsals with all the speakers uh, even last week. And uh, this particular slide I really, really think is so to all of us today, right? I mean, just look at that. the maritime attack 900% in three years. Okay. So think what does this mean um, for your? Um, for your company, um, for your vessels, uh, even for your cyber teams, your IT teams over here. And how can we make this relevant? And Ilya will share a bit of that. Uh, back to you, Ilya. Thank you, Evan. So uh, I wanted to talk about this example that I'm sure everyone on this call is uh, well familiar with. So we had the Suez Canal blockage uh, in May in May this year, March this year, sorry. Um, and uh, at first, my, my initial thought was that uh, this was this is a case of human error, per, perhaps some equipment malfunction, and that's why this happened. Uh, maybe the difficult weather conditions. But when I uh, read about this case and learned more deeply about it, uh, I, I became more open to other possibilities. So let's look at the ship. So Ever Given was built in May 2018. It's one of the uh, newest, uh, most advanced and largest container ships ever built. It has uh, it has state-of-the-art technology and it has multiple backup uh, power sources. So one of the masters on the ship later said that they have three backup power sources. Plus they have, uh, because uh, they have state-of-the-art technology, they have multiple systems that could be accessible remotely, including instrumentation, control system, communication systems. So this is ever given. So we have a brand, brand new ships, very well connected. And uh, at the same time, we look at the uh, cybersecurity posture of maritime industry in general. And we see, and this, this was mentioned uh, uh, before by, by Professor Yu and uh, I think by Oren from uh, SASA Software. And um, these networks on the ships on the ships are not well segmented. And they're not, if a hacker was able to infiltrate and get access to one device, he would be able to uh, access all other devices as well. Uh, additional problem, uh, additional challenge is that uh, you have a default password on firewalls, on PLCs, and even on satellite uh, communication equipment. So all of this makes a sheet, a, a sheet like uh, Evergreen uh, very vulnerable. So if you look at the day of the incident, March 23rd this year, the wind conditions were relatively mild, uh, 50 kilometers uh, an hour. It's not very significant for such a large uh, ship. Uh, and Ever Given had a windy impasse. It did not go straight. It sped up and uh, it kept uh, slowing down. Uh, and at some point it lost power, despite having the three backup systems that I mentioned before. And the uh, anchors uh, were not deployed, which is an emergency procedure. They, they should have been quickly deployed. Uh, in addition to that, ships in front of the Ever Given had no issues. Ships behind of the Ever Given had, had no issues either. And so that's Canal Authority said that weather conditions were not the main reason for, for the grounding. So what, what did we get? So we had the uh, uh, Suez Canal blocked for six days and backlog, backlog of uh, three, almost 370 vessels that couldn't pass through the canal. 
as a result, uh, we, many of us felt that global supply chain uh, were, were delayed, and there was estimated $9.6 billion in train, trade holdup. So we don't know if this happened necessarily from an IoT cyber attack, but uh, PLCs, PLCs could, could have controlled their rudders. Um, and in general, IoT attack could, could have easily caused loss of propulsion, going of course, uh, equipment damage. So all of this uh, could, have, uh, could have been done by through an uh, IoT attack. So, um, uh, so this is my last slide. I hope I'm, I'm on time. Um, we have we put all of these devices that uh, the professor you also mentioned. We, we, ha we have to put all of these devices on our on our vessels. Why? Because we want to be competitive. We want to be compliant with regulations. So we have to put the devices. So the question is, how do we do secure them? And the way we approach it is with uh, three steps. So step number one, when the firmware of the device is still being developed. We have uh, this, we do study analysis. We scan it for known vulnerabilities, CVEs, common vulnerabilities and exposure. Uh, we, uh, we try to look for operating system misconfiguration. Then we look if any risky tools were left on the device, for example, network scanners or debuggers. And then we're going to check if any third party libraries that, that are known to contain vulnerabilities are present on the device. Finally, we're going to check if there are passwords that are, that are too simple. Or, or they're using a weak, weak algorithm for, uh, for storage. So next, before we ship the device, we, we're going to add the active protection. So uh, step number one, we protect it against threats, threats that we know of. Nice. And step number two, we protect nice. against threats that we don't know yet uh, about. And, and the way we do it is with uh, uh, control flow integrity which protects of, of any buffer stack overflow or buffer heap overflow attack, which means uh, basically you cannot uh, you, you cannot make the device act in a way that it was not supposed to. Second, we're going to do whitelisting to make sure that only executables that are allowed will, will be able to run on the device. And third, we're going to make sure that additional files cannot be edited in an un unauthorized manner. So if you have configuration files or log files, a, a hacker would not be able to just uh, uh, edit them. Finally, once the device is already deployed on the vessel, whenever relevant, it doesn't have to be always, but we can continuously monitor uh, the device, uh, monitor its resource use, and look for indicators of compromise to see if some uh, something happens that looks like the device has been hacked. And of course, if attack did happen, uh, we can run for forensic analysis uh, to, to identify it. Uh, so this is it. This was much quicker than, than I would hope to. Uh, thank you, guys. And I'm looking forward to any questions that you might have. Thank you, Ilya. Thank you so Thanks. much. Uh, next up, uh, we have one of my dear friends, uh, Boon Ping. Uh, Boon Ping comes from the, uh, from the Menlo team uh, based over here in Singapore. And he's going to be sharing something that uh, affects all of us, right? Uh, I mean, all of us who are especially... Um, even in your own countries, uh, many of you are still uh, have to work from home. In Singapore over here, um, most of us, uh, by law, are still working from uh, from our home, not from the office. And many of us are also um, our parents, like myself, uh, who've got children who are studying uh, at home for the, at least the next one week before they go back to school uh, proper, because we want to make sure that COVID doesn't really spread. Now, what that means is, right, um, how then do we secure ourselves, um, our work, right, um, from anywhere, uh, from working from a Starbucks or even working in our, our desk? And many of us will be going back to hot desking, right? Uh, I know so many of my friends who work in Shenton Way who are, who've been informed, hey, you know, in DBS, you know, these particular two uh, departments will now be hot desking uh, because it's first come, first serve. The best people who get in first get a view of the marina barrage in the mornings. So even UBS, uh, Facebook, a lot of people are moving towards hot desking, even if they've got real estate space. So Boon is going to share with us um, a really new approach uh, to understanding how um, the threats can actually come. And by actually understanding a bit about this, distilling it, um, we can better understand how we can secure your work where you are. Boomping, take us away. 
Sure, and thanks, uh, Ewan, and uh, good, very good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I will just actually quickly walk you through in terms of the uh, current landscape. All the presenters have actually shared with you in terms of the, uh, the track landscape, and uh, also I want to actually uh, bring you up the attention. This is actually is a, a report done by CyberAge where they actually have a, a light uh, survey or the C level executive, and uh, based on their feedback, is uh, by 2020. One, which is actually right now, there's actually 76% of them actually think that they are likelihood to be actually attacked uh, within this year. And what we have actually seen over the last first half of the year is um, um, it's actually no, no stopping of uh, increasing ransomware attack, where uh, this is actually in, in uh, conjunction with what the uh, survey have actually uh, provided the input. 76% of them actually feel that they will get actually uh, uh, attacked. And we actually see the now ransomware attacker not just uh, encrypt your data, they actually do double extortion, uh, which is uh, to actually exfiltrate your data out first before they actually encrypt your data. If you do not pay, they will then actually uh, release that company sensitive information. However, even though no matter how, how much awareness training that we have actually teach uh, our user not to actually uh, be clicking on malicious or sensitive uh, or, or those suspicious link to, to not get yourself into trouble, However, there's actually still a lot of uh, user fall victims and uh, enterprise, especially the, like the marine times can actually fall victims, uh, none other than any of the enterprise out there. And 62% of them have been actually targeted uh, by cyber criminal in the 2020 alone. 58% of them pay the ransom uh, due to uh, actually various reasons, even though we actually encourage people not to pay, but uh, if the data is actually very sensitive to you, it actually affect your marine time, uh, your ship movement, etc that is actually going to cause a lot of problem and pain to you. And uh, even though you pay, there's actually 33% of them actually never get to recover their data back, even though you pay. Simply because uh, some of the ransomware uh, attacker, they are just out to actually take your money and uh, they will not actually give you the decryption key. Or maybe they are actually just uh, using the, uh, the, the off-the-shelf ransomware and uh, package it, but they do not have the decryption key. Their objective is just to get the money from you. So it's a gamble if you actually pay the, the, the attacker. Um, and the threats is actually not showing that, uh, slowing down that we have actually seen. In uh, The threats is actually on the increasing side uh, and ransomware have been actually doubled uh, year on year um, uh, versus uh, this year alone. Uh, first half of the year, we actually continuously every week seeing um, a, a company actually got the uh, infected education institute, Marine Time actually uh, get uh, infected or, or get a, a ransomware attack. So breach, they are actually definitely inevitable, but uh, we can actually definitely uh, slow them down. And uh, what the attacker have been actually constantly innovating is, is actually as the COVID-19, this pandemic actually moved uh, people to actually uh, from on-prem to actually using a uh, work from home or work from anywhere. Uh, the clock uh, adoption is actually on the rise. And of course, when it actually on the rise, there's actually chances that you will get infected like uh, using Google Drive or Dropbox or even uh, uh, Office 365, uh, OneDrive to actually uh, use them to actually propagate threats. The most important one is mobile and remote workforce is now, now the part of the primary work tools of what we are doing today. And this is actually where we don't, we can't actually really secure them because those are not company issued uh, device, especially like mobile device. And uh, if you have actually a remote workforce, uh, the workers is using their home computer to actually VPN back into your organization to assess sensitive data, that is actually also beyond what you can actually control. Uh, but however, you will still be subjected to the same kind of attack. So the problem exists with uh, current defense. We are actually doing a plumbing work using existing plumbing technology, which is actually uh, allowing what is good and bad to actually go in and out of your um, perimeter. And we are actually using that. When people work from home, we are actually using the same architecture, but however, the detection technology uh, piece, which is the plumbing uh, technology that we have been, been using for the last 10 years, is actually no longer going to be effective because there's no parameter. Human people now is the new parameter. Where the people is actually residing will determine where your security measures will need to be. And uh, this is actually not going away because internet is actually the work of life for us now. And uh, however, 90% of the threats actually coming in from two main vectors, which is actually web email. Yeah. I, uh, I found this totally absorbing, but uh, you know, just for listeners over here today, um, many of whom, I just want to stress, have received ransomware 
attacks, okay? Yeah. Uh, simple uh, question for the Mendel team, right? Should you pay the ransom? What yes. concrete, simple steps uh, that our audience can, can take for this? There's no simple yes and no answer whether you actually pay or not. But of course, the uh, general guideline is uh, from security practitioner like ourselves. We do not encourage people to pay the ransom. Why is because once you actually pay the ransom, you are actually sponsoring the attacker to actually innovate themselves or creating a new generation of ransomware to actually target you. Or they might actually even find that, hey, this is actually one, one guy that actually will be willing to pay um, I create one more variant and target him again. And uh, once he get infected, then uh, I can get a, a second round of uh, uh, money from these uh, victims again. So we don't actually typically recommend. However, it is always a point of time where if the data is actually impacting your operation and you need the data and you fail to back up the data to somewhere else, um, that's actually where it's a business decision whether you pay or not to pay the ransom. Yeah. Thank you so much for these practical uh, uh, pieces of advice. Yeah, yeah, please continue. Sure. Okay, so let me just uh, wrap it up uh, with, uh, within a few more slides. Uh, it's actually digital transformation over the last uh, one year and a half have been actually uh, revolving around moving on prem into the cloud and uh, we actually seen that there's, there isn't any parameter like what I mentioned earlier humans are now the parameter where the humans is actually residing that's actually our new parameter that we actually need to secure and the cloud adoption is actually where the Menlo security is actually providing the securing the work and uh, transforming your business as uh, so does the security we are actually putting behind our old plumbing technology, which is actually our secure web gateway, our proxy solution, where we only look at what is actually the bad and good to actually determine to, to actually the provide the protection. This is actually a new era where we actually develop and uh, the, um, provide customers, like uh, any customers in the industry, including the marine time industry, the ability to actually secure the user anywhere, anytime, and uh, in, most important is the reduction of the uh, team uh, ability to actually respond to the alerts. Like for instance, uh, patching. Uh, there's actually times where the, when zero day is actually been uh, disclosed, you will not be able to patch them. So that's actually where a new architecture is actually evolving, known as the SASE model, secure access of uh, security edge, where the Gartner have been actually the educating customers not just focusing on one area of uh, protection, uh, which is actually the overall holistic protection from a single uh, provider. And the Menlo Security actually provide that, and we integrate with all the, uh, the most of the vendors right now over here, including the CDR vendor like Sasa, and uh, even uh, Threat Intel like Flashpoint, then is where the, you can actually ingest in the, uh, the, the logs from the user where they are accessing to, even you have actually a ships that's actually using a satellite communication. You can actually ingest the logs to any of the platform that you have and then do your threat intelligence. Uh, but the most important aspect is when Menlo is actually coming from is we are teaching the old plumbing technology of doing what is good and what is bad. We don't detect just like the, the COVID uh, the way how we actually uh, pro provide the, uh, the, the or slow down the spread of the, 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 uh, the this pandemic or the virus is to isolate any positively the patient, identify patient, as well as the close contact. In the cyber world, we can't actually uh, do the, the isolation if you don't know what is actually good and bad. So in the cyber world, what we do is actually, we actually use the same concept of what we do in the physical world, but without the detection, we simply isolate them. Um, and this is actually where the evolution comes, where we actually can provide a new technology called the isolation capsule. Any, and we actually sandwich between the user and internet, regardless of what is good and bad, everything only get executed inside the isolation capsule away from the user. And you can think about this technology as a, 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 like a Star Wars movie hologram projection, uh, regardless of which website that you are visiting, whether they are good or bad. Once you actually visit them, you can actually simply allow the user to safely browse the content without worrying about the content, whether the JavaScript is going to exploit you, this is actually not going to actually cause any of concern to you because all those malicious JavaScript or codes only get executed inside the isolation container away from you. 
and you are only getting a representation, which is what we call the hologram projection back to your computers or your browser. So effectively, anybody that actually pull out a real gun inside the isolation container, fire at you, you will not actually get injured or you will not actually bleed at all because everything is actually run and executed inside the isolation container. Yet, you can actually safely view the content through the isolation container, which is actually the uh, disposable virtual container that actually render back the content. And this is actually back with a malware warranty that we provide. Okay, so oh, all this is actually all the, something that we can actually provide and uh, we can actually uh, let you actually trial the solution and uh, we can actually discuss more. Even lovely, lovely. Thank you so much, uh, Boon Ping. Uh, in particular, I love the uh, sharing you had about the uh, cross-border um, because uh, shipping and logistics supply chain, right, um, really transcends uh, geography and each of us uh, are affected by this. So I find that really, really relevant. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, the next particular speaker, uh, Mike, um, uh, comes from a company that uh, that I have a particular fondness for, okay. Um, um, my mother used to be a teacher. Uh, so the other being an English teacher uh, himself, uh, Mr. Jack Ma, um, is, is totally inspirational, how he built um, Alibaba. Uh, from from a, a simple e-commerce company into something that was so so inspiring today. Um, I remember meeting him uh, just a few years ago uh, and, uh, and Mr. Daniel Zhang as well uh, in Shanghai. And and you know I, I've met a few uh, celebrities in the time of time uh, when I used to interview them, but I tell you the the loyalty that people have to 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 him in person is just amazing to, to see, okay? Uh, I really just one tiny anecdote because it left such an impression of me. So at the time he was doing a press conference, which I was at, and um, one of the journalists from uh, the BBC, uh, this is a true story, um, and I was there, all right? And I was sitting next to the journalist, so I actually knew what exactly happened. So he stood up, right? And it's obvious he was trying to get a soundbite. So he said, uh, Mr. CEO, Tama, I just wanted to ask you, okay? Um, we have all these companies, right? Uh, like Facebook was in the, the audience as well. Uh, LinkedIn, eBay, and Yahoo, who are no longer here in China, all right? And uh, that some people say that there's unfair competition and preference given to Chinese companies. Is that true? And, and Mr. Ma took the mic and, and he, he stood up and he said something I will never forget. He said, uh, no one is forcing anyone to use any solution, okay? Um, we, people here use Alibaba uh, simply because it's easier, uh, it's better, and the payment system that we have worked so hard to build uh, is so much more effective and efficient. And what happened was most of the audience, both international and local Chinese, they stood up on their feet, and it was a huge hall, and they started clapping. And, and when Mr. Ma was leaving, okay, um, I remember his 12 bodyguards surrounding him before he went to his black A8, and um, he was incredible. It, you know, sometimes CEOs are very aloof. Don't come to me, right? I'm a superstar. Um, he actually took out his name card holder. I'm not kidding you guys. And he started out giving out name cards to us, as though we were an associate, his name cut. And, and that really moved me because I realized that this man is so incredibly humble, all right? Um, and it's such a pleasure with this to, uh, to introduce uh, Mike. Um, I know Mike works with Fei uh, Ziyuan um, over at the Alibaba team locally in, uh, in Singapore. Uh, they've done a great job of engaging uh, government over here. Uh, many MNCs also use the, uh, the product. And he's going to share a little bit about uh, compliance, okay, and uh, and what it means. Um, and a lot of you will find this especially useful. Uh, moving into uh, Bureau of Veritas, talking about IMO regulations for your shipping companies uh, as well. And I hope this helps you uh, uh, in your journey as well. Mike, over to you. 
Hey, thanks, thanks, even for the kind introduction and the praises to our Ma Lao Si. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I'm sure he will be very happy to hear what you have just said. So Thank without further ado, I'll just run through our short, my short presentation about cross-border compliance and, and what company needs to do. Now, uh, this is just a high level what to go through. So just let, allow me to do a brief introduction about Alibaba, where we are today. So our footprint, not just in, 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 in the Asia, but we also have in the West, like the East Coast of America and the, as well as the West Coast. And we also have the office in UK, Germany, as well as uh, in Middle East. So, so, so that's where our partners actually like us. So these are some of the partners that we have in the logistics space as well as e-commerce space that actually string up together with the, your shipping industry. So to some of these uh, business owners, they may not be a tech or infosec expert. And when today all the wonderful technology that we have, they may not be able to appreciate, unfortunately. So how can they or we help them to make a decision? So then compliance comes in. So next, I go, I'm going to briefly run through about the, the regulation around um, the region as well as the global landscape. Now, without much introduction, everybody is aware that GDPR is the tougher yardstick in, in Europe in terms of governing and protecting data privacy. And, and, and of course, the state is also coming up with their own state uh, law. Even though we know today there isn't a so-called a whole America privacy law or comprehensive law, as we want to call it, but slowly and, and, and surely, more and more states in the United States are having their own privacy law, let alone Canada. Canada has 30 years of privacy experience. Australia has easily 20 years. And the rest of the world, like the Brazilian, are also coming up with their own privacy law, let alone in Asia, we have Japan and South Korea leading the, the path. Now, closer to us, in the ASEAN country, we have 10 countries. Now, among the 10, I like to highlight these six countries, the Philippines, Singapore, Malaysia. Today, they already have the privacy law. And among the three, the Philippines has the strictest law in terms that was written in, in, in their law. However, enforcement-wise, probably they need to really catch up because they are at a huge country as compared to Singapore. Whereas Singapore, our privacy law is not so as strict as theirs, but our enforcement effort is really all out. <laughs> So the other three country is is I'd like to mention is Thailand. Now, if it's not for the COVID situation, Thailand would have enforced their privacy law last month. But because of many other situations back in Thailand, they have postponed their privacy law to next year, 1st of July, or if not 1st of June, if I'm not wrong. And Vietnam has just announced early this year to say that they wanted to turn on their privacy law uh, as early as December this year. Likewise, uh, to the Indonesia, as yesterday, I just attended an Indonesia focus group discussion by some of their government representatives. They are also trying to push up their privacy law for Indonesia. So, so these are the few countries to watch out for besides Singapore. Now, then taking into the context of Singapore, in fact, PDPA was enacted in 2012 and it was actually re, re, have a major revision last year and it was actually in, passed in parliament this year. And what I like to highlight is that the penalty has increased. So it will no longer be kept at $1 million fine, but 10% of your annual revenue, whichever is higher, of course. And then for today's session, I'd like to zoom into this one of the key obligations called transfer, or what we know as you know, cross-border. Now, as a shipping company, it will be meaningless if you can cross the goods without the person receiving it. That's where all the personal data are there. So that's where you need to know how to protect them. Now, when it comes to cross-border com compliance, in Singapore, PDPA, it was written that under a specific uh, condition, an organization may transfer personal data overseas. In essence, an organization may transfer the data overseas if they have taken appropriate steps. Now, this appropriate step was exactly what all the rest of the presenter has said all the security measure, all the different layers of detection, protection, and all the, all the wonderful technology. Now, that is a proper step. But is that sufficient? The answer is, it depends. <laughs> Unfortunately, sometimes the law or the regulator also want to see that whether the overseas recipient is bound by a legally enforceable obligation 
or what we know call as a specified certification. And today, I'm happy to tell you that Alibaba Cloud is one of such company that we are certified as an APEC CBPR uh, uh, holder. So cross-border certified. What it means is that we are we actually went through a very strict, stringent uh, um, assessment to say that we are have a sound policy to ensure that the personal data in our charge are well taken care of and meeting the APEC framework. Now, APEC CBPR was actually developed by the APEC economy to build consumer and business regulator trust so that we are able to do our cross-border data flow. Now, it requires businesses to implement uh, privacy policies consistent with the APEC framework, as I mentioned earlier, because different countries around the world, especially in the participating APEC region, they have different privacy law. So some, some are more stringent in this aspect, some are more stringent in certain aspect. Now, with this APEC CPPR, it somewhat harmonizes it, which is quite similar to the European GDPR, whereby 27 countries sit down together and decide what is the baseline law that they wanted to. So APEC CPPR is something that meant for the APEC economy bodies. And if uh, currently there are, besides Singapore, there are eight other participating countries under the framework, which include America, Mexico, Japan, Canada, Korea, Australia, Chinese Taipei, and the Philippines. And we will be expecting more and more company, or rather more and more country, to join the framework. So for more detail for the uh, CBPR, you can go to the two URL to find out what are the criteria. And besides having the APEC CBPR uh, certification, we also have other security compliance. So, for example, on the global landscape, or in fact, in, in Singapore, we have the MTCA Level 3 certification. Now, for payment-wise, we definitely need a PCI DSS. And of course, we also have complied with the ISO standard. So beside the next slide, also talk about the rest of the ISO standard, which is no stranger to all our uh, security professional. And likewise, the regional uh, compliance program that we have gotten, not just Singapore, we also have the German C5, the Iranian uh, National Electronic Security Authority, as well as the local government, uh, uh, Singapore PDPC or IMDA uh, Data Protection Trust Park. And these are the industry specific, the likes of TSAC, uh, the likes of HIPAA in US for the healthcare, and the trusted partner network for the content like the movies and stuff, action movies or, or uh, what we call the the, the uh, motion uh, animations. And that's wrapped up on my short presentation. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much. Now, next up, we have got Bureau of Aritas. Um, they are going to be sharing about compliance. Um, many of you I know are very concerned about uh, maritime, uh, how it actually um, applies, um, given that, uh, I mean, let's just be completely blunt about it, right? Um, so for the 21st of January of this year, um, IMO has uh, enforced um, regulations, basically that uh, the ships have to be compliance. Uh, they actually have to manage their cyber risk properly. All right. Uh, many people say that this is long overdue, uh, but instead of making it really uh, purely technical, what I really love about Philippe's uh, sharing, all right, is that uh, coming from the uh, naval background, all right, um, the military background, um, he's often able to uh, put these concepts in a very uh, actionable uh, manner. It's not really just uh, uh, theory. Um, the, the anecdotes, the kind of real life operational issues that a lot of you face uh, when you're running your, your companies, when you're operating your vessels, um, those of you who run even e-commerce um, uh, shipping related businesses, okay, um, will find this useful. Uh, and this isn't about putting things in, in a box, which is what I love about uh, Philippe sharing, all right? It isn't about a ship. It isn't about an offshore office that you need to protect. It's all related. When you get a ransomware in your in your iPhone, all right, asking you for 50 Bitcoin, and I show you that's very expensive now, all right? Um, it's, it's something that you will be able to relate to. What we are giving you is 
steps, um, even here that we take at Athena, right? Um, because we dog food what we do. Um, many of you here who run socks, like uh, for pure example, for Green Radar, for instance, you run your own socks, you run so your socks for other people. Uh, you've seen the kinds of threats that actually come through to your organizations. So it's not theoretical anymore, all right? It's, it's, it's real life. And it doesn't have to be something that's career ending. Uh, it doesn't need to be that call that uh, that we often get at Athena on a Friday evening um, saying, look, we think we've been hacked. Uh, what do we do? Do we get a compromise assessment um, done tomorrow? Can your guys come in on Sundays? And, and we often are, right? Uh, members of our, uh, of our board, uh, C-suites, uh, even our marketing director, like, like Jasmine Lim, for instance, she might get a call from um, uh, shipping, uh, really important shipping people. And you want to know, right? I've been hacked, man. What do I do? It's it's real. It's not theoretical. And when Monday comes, they better have a damn good answer, man, for their bosses who are asking. And what Philip's going to do for us is he's going to bring this uh, to life. Um, I don't know of anyone else who can talk about uh, cyber risk like he can. Um, and of course, like speaking with a French accent, uh, anything Philip says uh, goes up by 50 IQ points, as I often say. Philip, over to you. <laughs> Thanks, Ewan. Hello, everyone. Um, can everybody see my screen and hear my voice? Oui, bien, très bien. Okay. So, hello again. I'm Philippe Vaquet. I'm a cyber security operations manager for Bureau Veritas Marine and Offshore. And thanks to uh, Athena Dynamics for having invited us. I'm thrilled to be uh, here today among you. Um, we are part of an industry, the shipping industry, that carries nearly 90% of the world's trade. No need to discuss how vital we are for the global commerce. Think as a hacker would think. In one hand, a vital industry generating a huge turnover. On the other hand, in terms of cybersecurity, a vulnerable industry that is not entirely prepared and not really protected, with few cybersecurity procedures on board and fewer adequate crew training. The thing is, maritime companies are operating in a very competitive market and they can't always find funds for cybersecurity. It's a good thing companies start to realize the severity of the cybersecurity threat. For the moment, we lucky hackers don't focus on us. But trust me, that won't last. It is not by chance that big players in maritime companies are among the identified victims of cybercrime. The International Maritime Organization, the IMO, has understood quite early that when a ship's operating anywhere around the globe, a cyber incident is likely to trigger physical effects leading to potential safety or pollution incidents. That is the reason why a resolution was adopted in 2017 known as MSC 42898. It states that an approved safety management system should take into account cyber risk management in accordance with the ISM code. The same resolution encourages administrations to ensure that cyber risks are appropriately addressed in safety management systems no later than the first verification of company's document of compliance after 1st of January 2021. At the end, IMO wants companies to address cyber risk just as any other risk that is likely to affect to affect the safe operation of a ship, its crew, and the protection of the environment. This resolution alone is not enough to implement a cyber risk management that is required. So IMO has produced guidelines to help and BIMCO has completed this document with other guidelines on cyber security on board ships. Even with the help of these excellent tools and other initiatives, you may sometimes find it complicated to comply with IMO cybersecurity requirements. It's normal. It's a relatively new discipline. Plus, you do not necessarily have personal specialized in cybersecurity. This is why many of you have called on third parties. 
including classification societies such as Bureau Veritas, to help them set up a cyber risk management. And this cyber risk management can be recognized by an additional class notation or a certificate of compliance, which have the advantage of showing flag auditors that uh, the ship owner takes the subject of cybersecurity very seriously. But what's an effective cyber risk management? What do we say to clients who seek protection from cyber attacks? We usually start with two words. Be prepared. First of all, you have to understand that there is no zero cyber risk. But if you are prepared, you will limit the impact of the cyber attack. You will ensure the continuity of your operations. If you are prepared, you will not lose essential data and you will be able to recover normal operation within an acceptable time. You want to know what's behind my be prepared. OK, uh, now is the very moment when the former officer in me comes to deliver his wise advice. Consider cyber risk management as a battle plan. And the first rule in the battle plan is know your assets. You have seen today that the ship's systems are divided into IT and OT. IT stands for informational, information technology. That's the word of business computers and personal devices. OT stands for operational technology. That's the word of automation, EGDIS, or uh, any monitoring systems. Any connected IT or OT system on board can be affected by a cyber incident. And as the systems are more and more interconnected, a breach of one system can quickly spread throughout the ship's network and compromise other systems. If you don't have a clear view on your OT IT equipment on board and the way these systems are interconnected, you cannot be prepared to face a cyber incident or a cyber attack because you won't know your vulnerabilities and you won't know how your operations will be impacted. Whenever some equipment on shore is somehow connected to your vessels, you need to know how these connections are operated. This also applies to third parties who have remote access to your vessels for maintenance, software updates or monitoring. In Bureau Veritas, we regroup all these assets information in one very valuable document that is called repository. Knowing your assets definitely requires a risk analysis. This is also something that is requested by the ISM code. This risk analysis should, should be carried out by specialists because it requires real expertise in cybersecurity. But you have to be involved as well in this risk analysis because this risk analysis is going to require your knowledge of your vessel and your crew. This risk analysis is essential because it will pinpoint vulnerabilities and propose to the ship owner a series of organizational or technical measures to be taken, such as the ones that have been mentioned today. The goal here is to limit the surface of attack for the hackers and reduce the consequences of a cyber incident to an acceptable level. Second rule in the My Battle Plan, know your enemy. Everybody in your company needs to have a clear idea of the main cyber threats you're likely to encounter. There is no need to be a cyber security wizard to understand why you can be tricked by a falsified email that contains a malicious link that will deliver a ransomware. Get help with this if you don't have your own resources or a cybersecurity specialist in your company. Cybersecurity awareness is essential. Crew training is essential and it's also required by the ISM code. Most cybersecurity breaches are caused by human error. And human error is most of the time explained by a lack of knowledge, awareness or vigilance. So train, train and train again. Trust me, it's a really good investment. The cost of awareness is out of proportion to the cost of successful cyber attack. Maersk lost $300 million in 2017 because of one click 
from one Maersk employee in Ukraine. For your training, you can call on lots of companies whose mission is to educate executives, officers, and seafarers on cyber threats. This can be done on virtual learning platforms. Bureau Veritas, for example, has two cybersecurity courses online, one basic dedicated to the crew, and uh, one almost finalized advanced one for the managers. This training can be achieved in the form of live masterclasses as well. Well, organize this training as you wish, but do it and keep trace of the training for ISM auditors. If you're not convinced this training is paramount, you have already lost the battle. Third rule in the battle plan, be organized for the fight. In this cyber risk management, you must define roles, rules and responsibilities. You must appoint a cyber responsible on board every ship and on shore. You need rules. Your captains must have a document where your cyber organization and your cyber rules are described because they will be in charge of implementing this rule on board. I'm talking about a single document valid on shore and for your whole fleet. Bureau Veritas call, calls it a cybersecurity policy. Some call it cyber management plan. Well, call it the way you want, but it will have to be inserted in your document of compliance because flag auditors will want to see it. Being organized also means implementing robust and adapted procedures for OT and IT systems and equipment. Relevant crew must know where to find these procedures and of course, how to implement them effectively. And here too, training will be essential. As Flashpoint has already mentioned, just like there are fire drills, you must have cybersecurity drills as well. For Bureau Veritas, these procedures are part of a document dedicated to crew that we call handbook. So let me recap. The best way to protect yourself from the consequences of a cyber attack or a cyber incident is to prepare effectively with a real battle plan. Know your assets, know your enemies, organize accordingly and do train your troops. It may look like a joke on my slide, but I'm deadly serious here. Cybersecurity awareness and training are for everybody from top management to seafarers. Your IT hygiene is essential. Again, this will not be enough to avoid a cyber, cyber incident, but the severity of the consequences of the cyber incident will depend on your preparedness and your ability to manage it. But needless to say, this state of readiness must be maintained. Cyber uh, security shouldn't be a concern uh, only when an audit is announced. Um, pardon, uh, yeah. uh, Monsieur Philip. Um, we have a question from uh, 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 Mr. Hiroshi-san, okay? Um, and the question is, uh, just back to your few slides ago, you had the uh, question, you had the point on different types of assets, right? Um, yep. So uh, specific, I guess, uh, and even better if you have it to the Japanese context, um, what kind of uh, OT equipment, all right, um, inventory-wise would be helpful for, um, for having as your assets or for managing your security risk? Yes. Um, you will find the list of these common uh, systems, OT systems, in the BIMCO guidelines. We're talking about uh, navigation system or bridge systems. We're talking mm -hmm. about communication systems. We're yes. talking about cargo management systems, monitoring systems, and then business systems. Mostly, these, these are the big families, right? Uh, and of course, machinery. Uh, but you can find this uh, information in the, in the BIMCO guidelines on cybersecurity on board uh, that you can easily download on, um, uh, on the internet, of course. And this is the, the, the list of, that the IAX is going to use as well in the unified requirement that they are preparing. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, what I'll do as a follow-up for this, uh, and we want to make sure that a lot of your questions that you have sent to us and texts that are uh, responded to diligently. Uh, Hiroshi-san, I will uh, follow up with you separately, uh, uh, a direct message, 
um, to ensure that you have uh, the Vimco uh, details. Okay? Cool. Thank you. Uh, Philip, over back to you. Well, it's almost over. I just I was just saying that cybersecurity shouldn't be a concern only when an audit is announced, right? And because the threat is permanent, I hope you have understood that this morning and today at least. It's a permanent threat. It's an evolving threat. All industries are susceptible to being hit. Hackers are getting more and more organized. They're getting bonus for getting the best ransom ever. Their estimated annual turnover is the same as Walmart's. So the shipping industry can expect a long fight. Therefore, do stay alert. And as I told you many times today, be prepared. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Philippe. Really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, and last, uh, we received a uh, little best for last, uh, Oren Kaplan. Uh, over from uh, Pantera, uh, formerly known as uh, Sysis. I'm going to be uh, sharing uh, with us about uh, automated uh, pen testing. Uh, I know that many members of the audience have asked when we were sending out the uh, invitations, um, what is automated pen testing, right? Um, I mean, especially Singapore uh, going towards a uh, smart nation, uh, the vision for the next five, 10 years. Uh, as well as digital nation with everything being automated. The idea that something that's pen testing, uh, which is a type of cyber um, action that you don't need, uh, even people outside the industry to know what a pen test is. And people were asking us, you know, members of our events team, how is this, how is this even automated? You know, um, we already spend uh, money every year doing our annual pen test. How do we, automate that, is it costing less? Is it costing more? Should I do an automated test every month to be safe? How is this different from a vulnerability assessment from a VA? Should I do this as a managed service? Um, Oren will cover a lot of these uh, in a nutshell um, during the session. Uh, Oren, over to you at uh, in Tel Aviv, over in Israel, one of our Israeli friends, uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Ellen, and uh, thanks, Athena, for hosting me. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, first of all, let me start by quoting some of my colleagues. Uh, you know, the attackers have to be right one time where we have to be right 100% of the time. And this is, I think, the message here. So, again, hi, everyone. I'm Oren Kaplan. I lead Patera Business in the APAC region, and I'm very, very excited to be here uh, amongst you guys, uh, the best maritime companies in Singapore. So, I'll start with the fact for the past decade and more, all of us in this room were focusing on getting more technologies in order to better protect our infrastructure. Our legacy application, IT environments, cloud workloads, our everywhere office and our employees. The focus until now was mainly around bigger, taller, and hopefully stronger walls, AKA prevention technologies. The second focus was exact opposite. Prevention is not good enough, Let's add more visibility to detect and respond. However, we still hear the news daily, and all of my esteemed colleagues beforehand spoke about ransomware. We hear the news daily. The past decade approach is simply not working. We count on these embedded security uh, controls in our infrastructure to protect us. But have we stopped to really validate that these investments that we're making are actually working? Are the new technologies that is are, are are the new technologies in our security operations working as intended? Do they meet the promise for which they were brought to begin with? Were they kept up uh, up to date, aligned to your dynamic IT infrastructure that changes daily? So let's align that gap with the speed at which the business is moving and attack surface is expanding. Exposure levels are just getting bigger over time, while technologies are not adapting to the, to, to the new digital form and norm. So what I'm going to show you right now, in a few seconds, I'm going to present Pantera, which is the only real dynamic way to validate your controls and exposure continuously. By running Pantera, our automated penetration testing platform, on a continuous basis, you can really mimic the attacker's uh, actions and, and think and act like an adversary. 
And let me share my screen and begin by showing you the platform. All right, so the platform is called Pantera. And uh, yeah, we branded uh, to Pantera uh, Security uh, a few weeks ago. So the first thing uh, you do with Pantera, once it's connected, you start by defining an attack scenario and a way to uh, begin with Pantera. We have a black box test, which requires no credentials. It's an agentless platform. Uh, we have targeted, we have what if scenario gray box, meaning that you can give Pantera a starting point by implementing credentials. We have a vulnerability assessment module in case you want to use a vulnerability assessment and we have the targeted testing now the targeted testing will test specific things for instance we're going to introduce to the market a platform that is called a u ransomware ready to emulate ransomware strains uh, like maze networm uh, our evil wanna cry all these nat ransomware strains will be emulated in a framework that we built to actually answer a question for you tomorrow are you ransomware ready or not? But in this specific uh, pen test, live pen test, I'm gonna show you the black box test. So I'm gonna click on the black box test. First thing you do, you create a testing scenario. You give it a name, provide a range in which you want to test. So um, all, the all the devices in this range will be uh, tested by a full penetration testing activity. You can also exclude certain, certain IPs in case you don't want Pantera to touch them. Again, giving you a, whole, a huge control over what it's doing. You can defend the must, ma max duration of the test. You can run Pantera at night on the weekends when there's different attack scenarios and different attack surfaces. You can define what kind of attacker Pantera will be. Very stealthy one with thin enumeration, a stealthy discovery, or very noisy one with, very, with full enumeration and very noisy discovery. Again, helping you to understand the threshold of your SOC team of your SIM, of your EDR, your NDR, all the investments that you've done during the year will be tested with when Pantera is running. You also have an ability, Pantera is a platform that runs real exploitation. It finds vulnerability and exploits them. That's the only real way to test your breachability. Now, all of our exploits are safe. They were designed by our engineering team and were tested thousands of times. Their whole goal is to propagate the attack and do no harm. But still, since uh, sometimes this can be a struggle to some of our customers, at the beginning at least, we have an ability for each and every run of Pantera to ask for permission before Pantera runs an exploit on a vulnerability. Now, automation is king. You, you need the ability to run Pantera on a continuous basis because, like I said, dynamic IT change frequently. No more the days of running penetration tests once or twice a year because these adversaries, they stay dormant in the doorstep and waiting for, for you to mess up. So you have the ability to run Pantera on an automated basis, weekly, daily, monthly, or an ad hoc uh, basis. That's it. You hit create and run and Pantera starts working. Really, no need to be a penetration testing expert by any means to run Pantera. It's a fully end-to-end -end penetration testing platform that will validate everything you have and will show you the exposures that you currently are facing. The first thing Pantera will do will start with scanning and enumerating the attack map in front of it. It will understand what kind of devices are there, uh, they're running any services, fingerprinting each and every one of them. Next, it will move into a focused vulnerability analysis. Now. What we focus here is only on exploitable vulnerabilities. No more the days of 2,000 vulnerabilities ranked by CVSS on critical, high, medium, and low. Here we will focus only on exploitable vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities that will allow a, an attacker to leverage and move further into the network. We don't care if they're low or they're critical. Both of them are the same if they allow a hacker to leverage into your network. Not, not only that, we also test something that is called dynamic vulnerabilities. Dynamic vulnerabilities are not tested by vulnerability scanners since they require you to be dynamically there. Uh, things that are like mistakes that are done by users, misconfigurations of IT networks, shadow IT, all these things are not tested by a vulnerability scanner. Pantera does scan these and actually leverage them to see if it's possible for an attacker to take them and actually move in. 
So on the left side, you'll start, Pintero will start gathering achievements on the network. So in a few minutes, it was able to sniff credentials over SMB. These credentials were sent to the password cracking engine, the GPU that is associated with the platform, was able to crack the hash, validate the domain, validate these crack, these hashes in front of the domain controller. And what do you know, in 10 minutes, it actually was able to find, to realize that this uh, user is a domain user in clear text. Now, this is obviously game over for the organization, ransomware, you name it. Uh, this happened in 10 minutes by running Pintera, and this happens a lot. We still have 25 approvals of exploitation that are waiting to be run. We go into exploitation page, we click on the vulnerabilities that we want to exploit, we understand what kind of exploitation will run on which IP, we hit submit, and Pintera will propagate the attack moving deeper into the rabbit hole, exposing more and more achievements, as you can see here on the left side. Now, the great thing about Pintera and a platform that it's very, very easy to understand what happened. We have a full attack chain presented in front of us. The UI is very, very easy to consume. You have the root cause vulnerabilities, which are the shield icons, the broken shield icons, which you can decide which one of them you want to remediate first. So by understanding that there's three vulnerabilities on the top that created a skill chain, you can focus and prioritize the IT team's work to remediating one of these vulnerability first, prioritizing the work of the IT team and actually remediating what matters. You have, as a part of Pantera, we built a remediation wiki, which allows and helps their IT teams to actually read a recipe for remediation, like in a cookbook, step-by-step, step, follow the recipe. And the great thing about it, that you can use Pantera to validate that that patch was actually done correctly. And you don't have to wait and wait and wait again for that yearly uh, whack-a-mole uh, penetration test, that manual penetration test. You can click on each and every rectangle, understand the hashes that Pantera was able to sniff and the user and password that Pantera was able to uh, crack. So you can add this to the report. Here is another vector that actually shows you how Pantera was able to sniff a local user, bypass the endpoint security by utilizing several techniques, by utilizing seven, several techniques, and then uh, picking up clear text uh, credentials from the endpoint and lateral spray them, lateral move them inside the network. So I have one minute left, so I'll just want to focus one second on the reports. Very, very important, but important to note that these are actionable reports. You'll have top 10 priorities, action items that you need to uh, to go through in order to increase your resilience. You can't do top 10, do top three. You can't do top three, do top one and run it again. You never know what's going to happen. MITRE ATT&CK framework, if you're not familiar with it, I strongly recommend you take a look. We map all of our findings to MITRE ATT&CK, which is like the Bible of the penetration testers. We talk about TTPs, techniques, uh, tactics, and procedures of each and every attacker. And the crown jewel, you'll get a score starting from a C plus all the way to an A, which with time you can really improve by running Pantera, remediating, running it again, and doing it on a continuous and constant basis. This report can be also shown to the board, to the C-level individuals, because it's very easy to uh, consume. So with that note, uh, I'll send it back to the guys from Athena. Um, just one last thing, we offer free health checks um, to any organizations that would want to run Pintera. No commitment, free of charge. We take a small portion of IPs and we come in, we run the pen test for you to give you an ability to evaluate the platform. Thank you. And um, that entire process, uh, and I was actually shocked when we first um, when we first talked with uh, with Oren. And that process for testing uh, an automated pen test, incredibly thorough. I've seen the reports. It's basically half a day. So typically, we can start at uh, 10, 11 o'clock in the morning, um, and at four o'clock, uh, ready to do a deep dive. Okay. Not just a review, a deep dive on the uh, on on the findings, um, and and this is not us being said here, right? This is this is actual uh, actionable um, threats uh, that have been found uh, as a result of um, the Pantera machine literally working in the background as you work uh, remotely, even from home, um, and 
uh, you can get a results uh, after that. Um, and an anal analyst will actually be in uh, on that meeting itself uh, to clarify uh, if anything needs to be brought up either in foreign language basis. And we know we have got many members of the MOL team, uh, even those who are joining us from the Middle East today. Uh, a lot of it can be uh, translated. Um, into uh, into your native language with their with their experts on hand um, to make sure that it is refined, uh, not just so that it's accurate from a technical standpoint, but also that it's easy for an actual C-level person to understand it so that you can get the support you need from your leadership um, as we all go through this um, together, okay? Um, now, a big question that we've got from uh, one of our question, uh, one of our guests from Greece: um, Is it possible, Oren, to run uh, your automated? Is it possible to run automated pen testing on vessels as they are out at sea? As long as they have internet connection, um, if you want to do it remotely, you just need a VPN bridge to be installed on the tested network, or you mm -hmm. can just bring the laptop with you on the on the the ship if you want to do it physically no not remotely but short answer yes yeah sure uh also a question on my iphone coming from some of our shipping uh audience contacts um there's a lot of them and thank you for them come keep, keep making it coming um this one particularly yeah, interesting right so hey you when we often hear that um offshore offices are more targeted than our vessels but we've also heard many vendors come to us saying that ships at sea are attacking us. This is a large MNC who has requested I not name them, okay? So out of privacy, I won't do that. Um, so as we are implementing this, okay, um, what's the truth, all right? Uh, because many vendors that come to us tell us that we need to be protecting our vessels at sea. Is it offshore? Is it vessels that are more targeted? Which have you seen in your experience or not? So the question is referring to me. So yeah. I can tell you that in general, um, there's no limitation for where a hacker can go. We all mm -hmm. know that. Obviously, if those ships are connected to the World Wide Web or connected to the outside world, they're always in danger. Um, I think that if a hacker would probably go, it will go for the offshore first and then try to propagate into those vessels. That's, again, my assumption. But again, <laughs> assumption is the mother of all F-ups, if you guys uh, obviously know that. So never assume, always test. That's the only way to really know if you're safe or not. Great. Um, we'll just open this particular question to the floor as uh, as well to give the rest of the speakers an opportunity to uh, to speak uh, over at Samsung. Um, I know that I see a lot of uh, a lot of uh, incidences as well as the Alibaba team. Even oh my goodness, from a threat intel perspective, right, um, uh, Dennis? Uh, would you know even anecdotally uh, so we can help with this question? Do we get more attacks offshore offices or on vessels at sea? Uh, open to the floor, just jump right in. Ilya, if you want to take it, no pressure at all. Mike? Cool. Going once, going twice. Okay, we'll move on to the next question, everyone. Great. Um, another follow-up uh, question that we had, uh, this time from uh, from MOL. Hiroshi, thank you for your question. The question is, what is the minimum in requirements uh, that a shipping company should do from a compliance perspective? I'm just... Uh, rephrasing in a nutshell on the chat box, what is the minimum that a uh, shipping or vessel company or a logistics company has to do from a uh, requirements perspective in order to be compliant? Um, I know that uh, Philippe um, has had to leave for a 4 p.m. meeting um, right now, so we couldn't answer it. But uh, any of the other speakers want to, or if you know, from a compliance perspective, uh, feel free to uh, take the question. Uh, this is Mike here. So maybe I can share about the compliance perspective. So it, it all depends on where you are and what goods are you handling. 
So this will actually lead to the compliant requirements. So if you are handling sensitive chemical material, definitely you need to have certain kind of compliance to, that you are able to handle those materials. Similarly, it's beyond just security or privacy, but also the goods that you are handling. But of course, if if you are if you are looking into security, definitely we are looking into the lights of the international standard, the lights of ISO, or even the country where they have a specified uh, compliance requirement. I hope that helps. I see. I see. That certainly helps. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, it's it's quite incredible. So, message Philip and uh, Hiroshi San. Um, Philip uh, would like to also address it directly with you. He sincerely apologizes. Uh, he is uh, alive in another meeting right now, uh, but I will be reaching out to you and the MOL team uh, directly um, and uh, with my details as well. Uh, I know that uh, our leadership teams are both very, very close. Uh, please ensure we're going to do a good job of following up with you. Great. Anyone else have questions coming in? David? David Nordell uh, has a question, member of the audience, or my events team is sending this to me. His question is, what about testing of OT? Uh, David, you're on the, uh, the um, audience as well. We're going to have a bit of fun. Can you pose your question right here? Just speak into the mic, please. Are you there? David? David, uh, we've got to unmute for us to hear you. Yeah, okay. Can, can you hear me now? Certainly. Uh, if you could just share just a little bit about uh, uh, who you are, where you're from, which is from the audience. Yeah. Okay, I'm a cybersecurity consultant specializing in maritime, and I'm from Israel. Uh, oh, shalom. I've spoken, Welcome. Thank you. I've spoken at... Uh, cybersecurity conferences, especially maritime and all, all sorts of places. Not yet. I've spoken at a, another t uh, area in Singapore, not in maritime, but elsewhere in Asia, in, in Europe, in Israel, and so on and so forth. Um, so I'm interested in automatic pen testing. I'm fully aware of the potential for, of automatic pen testing for IT. OT is much more complicated, partly because there's a big variety of uh, protocols in OT. And by the way, there are also OT systems in ships that the owners and the, the people running the ships may not even be fully aware of. Uh, you, you buy a ship from another owner, it's got all sorts of stuff installed in it that's no longer being used, but it may still be connected to internal networks. Mm -hmm. And you don't know exactly what's there. It ought to be part of the overall risk assessment, but sometimes it's simply difficult to do. You can map your networks for IT much more easily than you can for OT. So mm. how do you deal with testing of OT given these circumstances? So uh, definitely, David, so thanks for the question. Uh, you're definitely right. OT is... Uh, not easy it's very complicated and it is uh, in abundance in ships uh Remember what i can me. tell you is is the following first of Not all supports by the way which is another me? important also in ports and this is another area that i don't think has been touched on including the relation the the technology relationship between the ships and the ports yeah so i can tell you that some of our customers are using Pentera on OT environments. Uh, one of the problems with OT environments is that they're very, very sensitive, sensitive. sometimes even, uh, even uh, scanning, enumerating, and pinging an OT device can cause it to drop. Therefore, in general, uh, we didn't design Pentera to run on OT. I know the customers, some customers of ours are still doing so because they run on Linux systems and they still have the same vulnerability. The great thing about Pantera is that you can define an IP range that you want Pantera to only test. And if you're uh, worried about specific IT, uh, OT equipment, you can just exclude them from the test itself. Or you can, at least if you do it uh, when the ship is uh, outside the port, when it's on the port, maybe you can choose to do so. But again, at your own risk, 
we designed Pantera to be as safe as possible, but we can't do anything about devices that can, you know, stop doing anything after we just ping them. So in essence, I can tell you we designed Pantera to be an IT penetration testing platform. We have customers that use it also for OT, uh, but we don't stand behind it uh, with a safety mindset that we do in IT environments itself. But you have controls, you have ways to to uh, control the test itself and allow you to at least uh, lower the risk of anything uh, happening. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Great. We have time for one more question. Uh, very, very aware we are almost running one hour over. Thank you for your questions, everyone. Happy to take any from the floor, anything that's uh, even from the speakers, one to another. Um, fire away. Any question at all? Great. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, everyone, for an excellent uh, session uh, this afternoon. Uh, I've been in the Zoom rooms, webinars, where things go over 15 minutes, even half an hour. This is the first time I've had one run over almost an hour later. Uh, but it's been a great session, some good questions over here that we've had. I wanted to give a very, very warm welcome, and uh, not a welcome, a very warm thank you, actually, for, uh, for all our speakers uh, who have come uh, this afternoon uh, for generously sharing your time uh, and your insights as well. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll now end the session. Uh, each and every one of the audience members that's come today, and even those that haven't come today, uh, we will be following up with you to get your feedback. Uh, have a great afternoon. I know a lot of you are jumping into meetings uh, that you've delayed to be here. Thank you so much and have a, have a great rest of your week, everyone. Take care now. Bye from Athena. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.